I'd like to call to order the regular board meeting of November 10th, 2015. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, everyone for uh, attending tonight. We've got a bigger crowd than normal. I would first like to, uh, since it's been one week since the election, acknowledge the uh, bond issue did pass last week. Uh, it passed in, I guess, majority fashion, despite some of the naysayers out there that were not well prepared. I think we had a good plan. Uh, we had good items in it. We did our homework. Uh, it resonated with the public, so I think we got a, a pretty good approval on that. So I would like to thank everyone who was involved in getting the ban passed, every passed, every yes voter. Uh, I know we hit social media pretty hard. Uh, I got a little tired of my non-Celine friends pinging me and say, I don't care what you guys are doing there. <laughs> I go, you got to put up with it for another week because I'm not being selected. So good job, everyone. Thank you. So this is the part of the meeting where someone may have public comment. Would anyone like to have public comment today? Administration. Um, just one quick comment because we have a lot on the agenda tonight. Just want to like to thank everyone who participated last Friday in the uh, match day program. We looked uh, to develop a match for a student, a former student. Um, who has leukemia, who's a, a daughter of one of our staff members, so I appreciate all the folks who took time out of their day. One, if they were within the age window to, to uh, get swabbed, um, but also who supported that wearing orange that day, and I really, really appreciate that. The next and, and second announcement I do have is that um, Patty Waltz does have 20 uh, pre-sale playoff tickets to sell. If anyone wants to get their pre-playoff pre-sale tickets now, as opposed to later for the game, 7 o'clock Horn Stadium against the Canton Chiefs. A little the rain and wind away. Yeah, it's going to be nice. Okay. Be nice. Uh, Board of Education members? Okay. Can I have a motion to approve the agenda as printed? So moved. Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying yes. 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 Those opposed? <laughs> Hearing none, motion carries 7 0. Schedule reports our state championship field hockey team. We could call uh, uh, like Kirk, Kirk, Kirk Evanson forward. And, uh, first, I want to say thank you for having us here tonight. And uh, congratulations on passing the bond millage. That's exciting. Uh, this is becoming quite a habit coming before you to introduce our next state champion. So, uh, Love to tell you a little bit about our field hockey team, led by Coach Eric O'Reilly, Coach, and our assistant coach Eric Boyer, who's also our newly hired uh, girls lacrosse coach. So a little bit about their season. Uh, they won the regular season championship and only had uh, about 78 goals for and only three goals against. They had a super dominating season. They just dominate play. 17-1-1 um, was their overall record. Uh, and then obviously, as you know, our, our state championship. I don't know if any of you have had a chance to see a uh, field hockey game. It's an exciting sport. I'm rather new to field hockey. I've been to about five contests now, maybe six contests, and each one more exciting than the, than the one before. But the last game, I have to tell you, and I know these girls could probably go into great detail, but uh, the game went to overtime, and then they play an overtime period where they reduce from 11 players to seven players. Is that correct, girls? Okay, so they had 77 for a 10 minute period. Again, they went to another overtime, which was a uh, five uh, person, uh, one at a time shootout, much like you'd see in the NHL. And our goalie, I have to say, I'm going to brag a little bit about Kennedy Boyer. Kennedy, we stand up. Our, our goalie was. Uh, Kennedy was absolutely amazing. She came out very aggressively and literally just knocked the ball away from the other players and then just, uh, I don't know, the, the wherewithal and the ability and her athleticism uh, to overcome and, and succeed. 
And I think all of these young ladies here before us really represent that. They represent what Saline High School and Saline Athletics stand for and that ability to uh, persevere, rise up, and, uh, and succeed. And they stand before you today as state champions. So I introduce this year's field hockey team. the field hockey, probably the first field hockey board. Oh, yeah. I mean, so Paul has been a huge um, contributor to the field hockey program. Uh, I can't even say enough, but we probably wouldn't have gotten to this point without your help way back when. And I know you continue to help the program. And obviously, Danny Hynek has, uh, was our assistant coach last year and helped out this year as, as well. So um, our captain said it all. Thank you guys so much for all of your support this year. I don't think we could have done it without you. This is an amazing group of girls. Um, I was with them uh, when we started the middle school program. They were, they were my eighth graders, <coughs> so the seniors. So stand up, seniors. Great job. Just a quick plug and thank you to both our coaches. They really epitomize what we expect out of our employees and our varsity coaches and our coaches at Saline. Uh, they stand for what's right. They have structured practices, they have high demands, they place responsibility upon their players, and their girls have risen to that level and, and found success. So we're super proud of them. Thank you for letting us be here. You have, can we get a quick, if you guys stay right there, Mr. Robinson, can you get over there? We get a quick picture of you guys sure. here at the board? All right, thank you to the uh, exiting girls field hockey team. Having uh, watched a lot of those girls play over the last couple of years, it was uh, exciting to see them win the championship. So our next schedule report is our audit report of the district for the 2014-2015 school year. Assistant Superintendent Warner. Yep, we've got Jeff Dalway and Anthony Sosanowski here from Plant Moran to give the board presentation. And I will be your clicker. My clicker. All right. I want the equal amount of emotion and excitement. Yeah, well, we'll try. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'll move this around a little bit. Yeah. No, but you know, I, I've watched your cross-country team run back in regionals a couple weeks ago, and I, you guys have a powerhouse cross-country team as well, so a lot of good things happening here. Um, my name is Jeff Dalloway. I'm the audit partner on the engagement, and uh, with me is Anthony Sassanowski. Anthony is the, uh, what we call the in-charge of the audit. He's here on a daily basis when we're out doing field work, making sure that the audit's going smoothly, working with Janice and the rest of the staff to make sure that things are happening as, as they should be, and basically uh, getting into the detail of the audit and, and pushing it forward. Um, my thought is to give you a little bit of a background on the audit process, give you the results, and then Anthony will go over about seven or eight different slides that really focus on the general fund of the district. Um, the audit process. So we start back in, um, let's say, mid-May when we start talking with Janice about what's happening within the district, look at any kind of unusual transactions or um, the counting issues that might have popped up during the year, make sure we got our hands around those. We come out for a couple days to do some preliminary work, uh, field work. We start getting into some of the federal program testing and the federal programs. We do uh, transaction walkthroughs and, and test the various systems like payroll and cash disbursements, look at the bank recs and wire transfers, things like that. Then we come back out in uh, mid to late summer and we spend about two weeks out in the field with about three people. 
And this is where we're really kicking the tires on the balance sheets and, and the P&L of the various funds. Um, we then assemble the financial statements. We send them up to a, a different group within our firm. That's a quality control check, if you will, <clears throat> the, the professional standards group. So then they, they take a read through the financials. If they have any issues or questions, we address those. We get back with Janice, make sure we're on the same page, and then we wrap up the audit, we issue the reports, and then we come here tonight to, to go over the results. So that, that's the synopsis of the process. Uh, the results. So we've got two different reports that we've issued. The first is about a 55-page uh, statement. And that includes all of your funds, you know, from general fund to capital projects, community services, athletics, and so on. It also contains a number of footnotes. So we got about 20 pages of footnotes, and that gives you a lot of the detail about your accounting policies, and a lot of the detail about significant balances, like your long-term debt. You find your interest rates, maturities, your scheduled maturity payments, things like that. Um, and that financial statement, I'm pleased to report that we've issued an unqualified opinion. So it might, it might not sound good, but it, that's actually the highest level of assurance we can render on a financial statement. The other report that we have is, an, is a report on the audit of your federal programs. So the district receives about $2 million of federal programs spread through about 10 to 12 different um, actual programs. If you receive more than a half million dollars from the federal government, you're required to have an audit. And this audit that we go through is a lot different than the financial statement audit. We look at compliance issues. So think about your uh, school lunch <coughs> program. There's eligibility requirements. So we'd be looking at eligible participants. We look at reporting back to the federal government. We look at things like uh, reimbursement requests, make sure that those are done timely, that they tie out to the records. So we're looking at compliance issues. Um, I'm also pleased to report that we've, we've issued an unqualified opinion on your federal programs as well. Um, so we did not have any sort of non-compliance issues or we did not come across any unallowable costs. So two reports, two clean uh, opinions. And I guess if you step back, you know, from my perspective and just kind of look at the audit overall, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to report also that during the course of the audit, we did, we did not come across any adjustments that we found as a result of our procedures. And additionally, we did not come across any control issues, internal control issues, where if we, you know, let's say a transaction was missed or booked incorrectly or an invoice didn't get recorded properly, you know, we we typically have to write that up, put it in a letter, and say we've got an internal control deficiency. So we don't have any of those either. So those two items, no adjustments, no control issues, it's, that's unusual. So I, I'd say in about 90, 95% of the audits that I do, we usually have one or the other. So I think it's a, it's a testament to Janice and, and her staff that you've got a good set of clean records uh, you're getting good information throughout the year, which I think is really important when you're making decisions from you. So with that, I'm going to turn over to Anthony. He's got uh, about seven or eight slides on your general fund to talk to. All right. So the first slide we're looking at here are just some significant budget items that we wanted to go over. Um, these are definitely uh, some one-time increases or decreases to the general fund balance. We're really specific to 2015. I wanted to highlight a couple of them. The first one is the Act 18 reimbursement restatement for 13, um, from 13 and 14, and we got the funds in 2015. About $1.28 million was received um, from the ISD um, as a result of uh, excess fund balance held at the ISD, but this is really just a one year item. And we'll bring it up a little bit later as to the impact on the general fund. Um, additionally, as you know, you're, many of you are aware, the sale of the Houghton property during the year on uh, of the district is about 380 grand um, during 2015. And then additionally, there was a net reduction in the salaries and benefits um, due to the contract negotiations that took place during the year and switched to the January 1 contract year, the calendar year contracts um, as a result of some concessions uh, from the teachers and support staff. There was about $500,000 in savings this year um, alone. So um, definitely some just kind of one year items we wanted to bring up to your attention. Go to the next slide. This represents the general fund balance sheet for 2015 and 2014. What you'll notice is the largest um, asset on the books is still the receivables, which represents primarily the July and 
and August state aid payments that were not received as of June 30th. So those received in the summer. They tend to be the largest um, asset on the books. Additionally, you'll note, um, you know, under the liabilities, you guys have a state aid anticipation note. And this is drawn down upon generally to help bridge the cash shortfalls, shortfalls due to the timing of payments from the state and just your general um, you know, operational obligations. We go to the next slide. This represents the general funds revenue um, broken out by the different sources, excluding MIFTA's 147C, which are funds from the state to help uh, fund the pension obligation. Um, what's important to note here is that, again, the a majority of the general funds revenues are from the state. That's where a lot of the money does come from. And it was up slightly uh, from 2014, primarily due to an increase in per pupil allowance of about $50 a head, but partially offset also by a, de a decrease in pupils from 2014 to 2015. Um, overall, revenues are up about $2 million, primarily due, again, to a couple of those one-time issue items, um, including the Act 18 sales of open land. Yeah, if you take out those one-time items, you'll see that the revenues are really stagnant year over year. You got a slight increase in your foundation allowance, but that was really offset by a small drop in, in pupil, uh, pupil count. So just like year over year apples and apples, it's really a stagnant year um, from a revenue perspective. Yep. Um, the next slide, this is and the flip side is the uh, total general fund expenditures, and again, excluding Mitzer's 147C contributions to the pension liability. Um, you'll notice that the over, overall, the district was able to keep total expenditures very similar to the prior year. Um, but again, we just wanted to point out the majority of the general fund's costs are related to salaries and benefits. Um, and again, that was, they're down slightly due to a net decrease in the health and salary sessions made during the contract negotiations, but um, that's partially offset by the, you know, what seems to be the always increasing retirement contributions uh, on behalf of the district. Go to the next slide. This represents the, really, it shows the per pupil, um, how much is going into the classroom relative to just kind of other operational expenditures. And then we compare this to the peers your other peers in the uh, district, other peer districts in the area. Um, you'll see that Celine still spends, you know, on, you know, per dollar of operating expenditures, 65 cents really goes straight into the classroom, which is really great to see, especially compared to some of the other schools in the area. The next slide. So this represents the change in the general fund balance over the past eight years or so. And over that time span, the net increase of the general fund was about $530,000. But again, we wanted to kind of point out that a lot of that is due to this one-time Act 18 stabilization money that we received this year. Um, without that money, the increase this year would have been about $575,000. And over the last eight years, then you're looking at a decrease of about $750,000. But um, I think it's really important to note the, you know, the positive trend um, that the general fund is experiencing increasing the fund balance. We go to the next slide. This represents the district's fund balance as a percentage of total expenditures, which you know, is used by a lot of districts just to kind of gauge where they're at compared to the state, um, other districts in the state. So you see the general fund's fund balance is still below the state average. Um, and again, we wanted to kind of show and break out the differences as if we didn't have the Act 18 fund in 2015. Uh, but again, this is also trending upwards, which is, is this, <clears throat> you know, so this is our highest fund balance, each week inclusive of the Act 18, at least since 2009. Looking at 2009, the state fund balance average was 13.3 percent. Yep. Now we're up to 7.2, and the state average has come down. Right? We're actually starting to fight that trend a little bit. State's coming to kind of get us, and we're actually on the way of that. Yeah, right. it's a continual effort. I mean, so from the state perspective, the, the economy hasn't been that great. The additional funding on a per pupil basis has been just incremental each year. And you see what's happening with retirement costs. And we're at about 24% in retirement right now. And that, that, I remember the days it was 14%, right? And now it's at 24. That's it's almost a double. It's almost 100% change year over year. You got that, you know, think about 
all the utility costs and transportation costs and just inflation in general, you're always fighting that. So at least we've got a nice trend here since 2012. Um, it takes a lot of work to get there because the number one cost is personnel costs. You know, you can only squeeze so much out of that $7 million or other. It's all the personnel costs is a piece of the budget. So <clears throat> next slide here. Um, yeah, I thought I'd give you an overview of this. So, you know, we, we put this in letters in the last couple of years. We talked about a big accounting change that was happening for, for school districts in Michigan. Um, essentially what's happened is the Governmental Accounting Standards Board thought it would be great if we took a look at the, the pension liability at the state level and dropped it down to each individual school district. And then they said, let's take that and put it on your balance sheet. So, you know, within your financial statements, you have two balance sheets. You have a short-term balance sheet, which is the fund level, which is your general fund. And then you have a long-term <coughs> balance sheet, which is like a corporation. And if you look at a public, public company statement, it's the long-term balance sheet. It's got all your capital assets, all your fixed assets, buildings, um, equipment, but it also has all your long-term debt. So all the bonds and things of that nature, bonds and our long-term liabilities are also in that. Well, the pension liability is on that long-term balance sheet, if you will. So it doesn't get reported in your general fund. Your, your annual payments, your monthly payments into the pension system, they get reported in your general fund. But the actual liability does not. So it's kind of off the balance sheet, if you will. And a lot of districts, you know, they're going to look at this and not really do much with it. The number that the state has allocated to Swain District, to Swain Schools, is $81.2 million. So that's what they're saying is your share of that unfunded liability up at the state level. What does that mean? I don't know. Because it's not like they're going to shut the doors on you like what happened with GM, right? I mean, so um, it's just a long-term liability. To me, that says that there's a fundamental problem that the state has to deal with. And you see what's happening in your budget every year. You've got this incremental change in the retirement rate that you have to reach into your pocket and put back to the state to say, here's our contribution to that liability. I don't know exactly where this is going to go, but it was just an accounting standards change that mandated that liability to push down to, to the district level. So it won't change things from an operational standpoint. I don't think we'll make decisions based on that. I, don't, I think most districts don't. I know one district, Dearborn, I remember they used to look at the full accrual to report the long-term liability or a balance sheet when they were making some decisions. So they didn't want a district I, I, I knew about that would actually look at that balance sheet for decision-making purposes. But when you throw that on there, it basically says you're, you're upside down and you're pumped. So, yeah. Well, but the, right. Everybody else, everybody else, everybody else, every district would be upside down. Yep. You'd be insolvent, you know, from just a pure definitional standpoint. And the rating firms have already taken that. That's right. Too. That's right. Yeah. yeah, the rating firms, you know, that they look at each district from a bonding perspective, they've already taken this into account. It doesn't impact you from that perspective. So I wouldn't, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an accounting issue that you got to deal right. with, but from a decision making perspective, it probably isn't anything you really need to do. So just kind of summarize what we just said there. So. That's our presentation. If you have any questions, we uh, have to stick around. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Janice, uh, kudos to you and your department for getting that done expediently and <coughs> excellently. I know you hate when you get those little things going in the wrong department kind of tick mark. So good job uh, by your department. Thank you. Thank you. Action items. Can I have a recommended motion to approve the application of Kathy Crone to serve on the Saline District Library Board of Trustees for a two-year term beginning on December 1st, 2015? <coughs> Um, Kathleen Crone is uh, she's a parent of uh, two former Celine grads. Uh, one, one people took me up way back in the day. Um, she's a, a Pittsfield Township resident. Gerald Crone, her husband, served on the Senior School Board. Is currently a trustee for Pittsfield. She's been active 
Um, most recently, since your retirement, and as a um, member of the Foundation for Senior Schools and chairs the Grants Committee, um, as an avid reader and supporter of the district library, so I think she'd be a good fit. She would be replacing Don File. Don's been on the uh, uh, district library uh, board for many, many years um, and is stepping down and retiring from that role. She should be a good representative for Senior Schools. All those in favor, please signify by saying yes. 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 Those opposed? Hearing none, motion carries 7-0. Can I have a recommended motion to adopt the resolution urging the legislature to support and continue to allow school districts to purchase electric supply from an alternative energy supplier? So moved. Second. So there are two House bills that were passed through the House Energy Policy Committee last week, um, House Bill 4297 and 4298, and 4298 in particular affects um, electric choice. Um, I believe that the version as it was passed would require alternative suppliers to purchase three years of physical capacity um, to show that they, they had that capacity on hand. And it's, an unreasonable requirement that's not required in other states and would probably drive those alternative suppliers out of the state. Um, Salinary Schools has purchased their electricity through MESIC, which is the Michigan Schools Energy Cooperative since 2002, and it has saved the district over $2 million in that time. We also purchase our heating fuel through Constellation Energy and have saved substantial amounts of money from them as well. Um, so we really do support electric choice and hope that you would sign a resolution that we could send up to the state showing that it, it's an important thing to the school districts. If we hadn't saved that $2 million, our, our fund balance would look quite different right now. So um, there is someone that has introduced uh, legislation to allow public schools to access school um, electric choice. Not all school districts were able to get choice because they capped it at 10%, and so not all schools got into it that we had. Um, I don't know where that legislation will end up, if it will get through or not. Who's, do you know who's sponsoring this, uh, DTE? Um, I'm, I'm sure they're, they're supporting the legislation. Okay. I'm not sure who the sponsoring legislators so were. Would this affect residential customers that also yes. buy off the grid? Yes. Somebody with big shoes is trying to start something, huh? Questions? Discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying yes. 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 Those opposed? Hearing none, motion carries seven to zero. Discussion items. Superintendent Graydon will talk about uh, how the bond's gonna go now that it's passed. Yeah, a couple of things. One to um, you know, pass out a uh, packet here. Um, there should be two um, two draft RFPs and then a uh, cover memo. Um, you have one, Paul? Yes, I have. Right. So one, start with the uh, the original draft memo or the memo on the top that talks about the bond. We get just a little bit about what happened on that on that Tuesday. Um, across the state, there were 25. Um, the qualified bond proposals uh, across the state, and 19 of them passed. Um, looking at that, it's a 76% pass rate. Many of those, uh, the, uh, the nine of the or eight of those, were extensions, so they did not require a, an increase. Um, I looked at the number of um, ones that uh, 11 of the 17 um, increases passed, so a 65% pass rate across the state in bond proposals that were similar to ours. Um, I did break down and look at um, the percentage of yes voters in each of those elections. Um, with the exception of Ellsworth, Michigan, they had a, t a two mil increase for a $2 million proposal up uh, kind of in central northern Michigan. Um, theirs passed a little bit better than around a 64% clip, and then um, ours passed at 62%, which was the second highest across the state. So again, I think, you know, kind of echoing President Heinick's comments about the voter approval, I think if we look at, you know, from the fact that we, we were asking for a one mil increase, it had an impact in terms of the, the individual taxpayer and individual homeowner in particular. Um, and then to think about, you know, not only did it pass, which will, you know, again, just over half the issues of asking for an increase passed, but second, 
only Ellsworth in terms of the number of people who turned out to vote yes. It was a great way for us to really understand the, the commitment that the voters had made to making sure that it's linear schools. And we talked about protecting our future. I think um, it echoes that. So there's that information there to just get a sense of where things went um, related to that. Uh, the next component really now for us is to, to look at um, hiring an, an architect and hiring a construction managing uh, management firm. Um, I've included in your uh, in what I've passed out here two draft memos or draft um, RFPs. We met in, in, on Friday, went over a couple of items associated with these. We're going to be meeting again tomorrow to dig a little bit deeper and, and, and potentially change a little bit in terms of what we've been trying to identify what's the best and, and, and most um, efficient way for us to, um, to send an RFP and certainly what is our best and most efficient way to um, produce the work that's being done without looking at having ourselves um, over um, managed in a sense in terms of, of the types of things. Much of the work we talked about being technology, much of the work we talked about being around buses, there's what we call FF and E or furniture. Do we need to have architecture and construction management um, fees associated with those projects? What are the things that we can do in-house versus what are the things that we need their support on? And we know there's going to be a mix. And so our, our proposal that we're looking to take forward and we'll be t uh, really digging through tomorrow um, is to really look at saying, is there a way for us to potentially RFP the first three years of the proposal? If you remember, um, it's a $67.5 million, 10-year uh, kind of bond proposal, of which $40 million was the first year, of which 85% you know, of it needs to be spent in, in the first three years. So essentially half, just under half of the entire bond proceeds will be spent over the next three years. And so that really feels for us that the, that's when the lion's share of the management services are going to be needed from an A&E and architectural engineering standpoint and from a construction management standpoint. So we've been reviewing these documents, thinking about ways to, to tighten this up to make sure that we, we're asking for appropriate help um, in, in, in terms of what we need, but ultimately not looking to, to sign long-term agreements that put us in a situation where we're, we're being managed over time and in areas where we feel we have proficient skills and capacity to be able to, to handle those. Um, so that's our next real phase. Our intention is to get the, um, these RFPs on the street um, as quickly as possible, frankly, this Friday. So by the end of this week, the RFPs will be out. If you flip to the back of, the, um, of each of the proposals, uh, or draft proposals, you'll see a rough timeline. I want to kind of walk through that a little bit so the board and the community understands where we're going. So we're, again, intending to get these proposals out on um, Friday, sending those out to, uh, really posting them, getting them out to uh, certainly a group of people who've contacted us and are interested in that. Um, requiring, we're talking about bringing them back on the 30th, although we're talking about bumping that due date back because one of the things that, that many of the firms <clears throat> are going to want to do is tour the schools. We have a date coming up the 26th uh, of, uh, or pardon me, the 25th of November is uh, no school day and it's a Wednesday before Thanksgiving. It's an ideal day for us to have contractors and construction firms and architects in, touring new facilities, getting a sense of what they're up against allowing us to talk about priorities and scope of work for that first three year window. And so our intention is that, that Mr. Clary um, and his team will be providing tour opportunities on that Wednesday before. And so we just want to bump that back instead of having them do on the 30th, have them do a week later in terms of being able to do those tours. We'll be conducting interviews, um, and again, probably the week of, still looking at, you know, similar to that week, um, but ultimately <coughs> looking at potentially having us asking for a special board meeting on December 15th. Um, we don't feel like we're going to be able to be able to make effective recommendations to the board by the meeting on the 8th. And so looking at uh, the 15th uh, in terms of having an opportunity for us to be asking the board at that time to authorize us to begin negotiating with uh, identified vendors based on the RFP process. Um, we, we talked a little bit in our finance meeting and I talked a little bit to President Heinick about the process for the RFP, having, um, having the board uh, members sit in on the RFPs as we interview. We're I, looking potentially after getting the RFPs back, screening down and interviewing three um, architectural firms and three construction firms, um, but we, we will be inviting board participation um, in those meetings as soon as we know for sure. These dates may, again, these are draft dates, we'll know by the, uh, probably by first thing Thursday morning what our intended schedule is for, for interviews, and we'll communicate that out to the board. Um, but as you can see, it's a relatively tight timeline for us to get moving. We'd love to be able to say we know who we're going to be working with um, by the end of, uh, by the 15th uh, of December, allow us to begin negotiating, but ultimately for us to complete the projects that we've talked about in terms of our safe and secure entries and some of the exterior work we're talking about from a drive standpoint out here, we really need to get those projects designed with the process that will include uh, staff and stakeholder community feedback in terms of this, so there's going to be a, a planning timeline, getting bids done and getting our bids out as quickly as possible, 
We are concerned somewhat with the, with the cost of construction. We saw there were 17 or 19 bond issues across the state passed. There's only a limited number of contracts. We want to be timing the market effectively to make sure we're getting good value uh, for the work that we're getting done and want to get done. And so um, we're, we're going to rush and, and, and be fast what we do, but we're not going to be um, so concerned about pace and speed that we're going to do something that doesn't meet the needs of the community long term. So that's the planning right now. Any questions about that portion? And I'll touch a little bit on the actual sale of the bond. Did uh, King Scott have input on these RFPs? Did they help or did um, they just? We, we, no, these are um, through MSBO and, and other organizations that we've got. These are just kind of what I would call draft or template RFPs. They're familiar with them. I have spoken to King Scott um, and they will be, they're very interested in here. It's been a good relationship so far. So the building work you're anticipating to have done by start of school in September? Yes. Well, as of just today is November of what? Yes. And, and, and Rex isn't here, so I can say that. Um, you know, one of the, one of our fundamental concerns is, is how soon can we get in? Because the, the type of work that we're talking, I'll use Pleasant Ridge as an example. The type of construction work that we want to do there between June fifteenth and, and you know, early September is extreme in terms of when you think about that. Um, we have talked about. I've spoken to Principal Bizu in particular with Ridge. Would there be a way potential for us to begin demo work around Memorial Day? Um, if that's the case, can we grab a couple of weeks? Our, particularly maybe our Spanish classes could be taught elsewhere in the building for those last couple of weeks to allow us to get a jump on that. Um, until we really have the, the construction and, and architecture and engineering place to really sit down and, and help us with that schedule, it's going to be tight. Um, I, I don't want to say right now that it'll be done because we need it done right. Um, I don't want to make decision and design um, um, decisions based on getting open by the first day of school. If we know the right design decision makes, means that it's, it's completed by the first day in October, we will be okay. We're going to start that project and we're going to get it done as quickly as possible. <coughs> if for some reason the project's not completed the first day of school, we'll have alternative plans to make sure we're providing education to all the students right there. Always oh, important to get it done right. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm equally or concerned in terms of the, the drive here. Right. You know, then right. We may need to you know, have some, some minor alternatives as we progress through that. You know, weather comes weather. into play, and some other things yeah. on those outside ones. So. That's a rich and have a weather issue. Should, yeah. All right, and just why. Yeah, the drive is good. Yeah, I've talked a lot about the entry point at Pleasant Ridge. Our intention is to focus on the entry points of all of the buildings next summer. Um, the other ones are just, they're less in terms of substantial, but there's a lot of them. So again, that becomes a management issue in terms of making sure that we're doing it, the designs are right, the contractors, the materials are available. I mean, again, it gets into a lot of different uh, aspects that we want to make sure we're doing it right, doing it appropriately, but we also want to make sure that it's a priority for the contractors that are out there. Can they be doing all those simultaneously? That seems like a lot. Of we may need right. It is a lot. We may need to have multiple contractors doing certain ones. Mm -hmm. You know, certainly from a design standpoint, from a management standpoint, in, in conversations they feel comfortable they can do that. But we may have the people who are doing the the heritage and the metals entry points may not be the same company that's involved with public bridge, etc. Questions about that portion? Um, as part of it, after the RPs are done, there, there will be a bond planning team. We'll talk more about that at following meetings. But um, there's going to be a, this will really drive the, the conversation at this table and, and, and really throughout the district over the next several years. And it's an opportunity for us as a board and as, a, as an administrative team and a community to really kind of define that pathway for our students moving forward. So I'm excited about it. Um, but it, again, it's a, it's a lot of work um, for us to do and make sure we do it and do it right. The, uh, the, the one thing that also needs to happen along is we actually need to sell bonds in order to have money. And so um, we, we met with Paul Starter, the finance committee, I don't want to steal the thunder. Uh, you, you guys can just keep on going. It's kind of part of the, part of the, part of the bond proposal. We talked about how we want to go about selling the bonds, and there's essentially a competitive um, sale that you can do, and there's a negotiated sale. Um, and talking with Paul Starter, looking at, at the market, um, we, we feel we're, that we would make a recommendation and, and we can touch on it again later, to do a negotiated sale. We have a potential partner um, associated with that who, who's done some other things with the district who's um, offered us a very competitive rate as it relates to their services. Um, they can bring in other partners to make sure that we can get enough potential bond buyers to the, to the table for us from an underwriting standpoint. Um, and then ultimately, we'd be looking to sell those bonds in, in some point time in that January window. Um, we budgeted for 5%. Um, percent. We think we can get it below that um, in terms of the quicker we can get to market, the better. Um, but again, once we once the money arrives, the clock starts in terms of our 85 and 100% spend. So it's not as though we want to hear tomorrow what we want to hear when we need it. So um, we're intending to bring a board resolution uh, to the board uh, the next meeting, two weeks from tonight. 
that's just the kind of the status update to the bottom. A lot of work in a week. Thank yep. you. Yeah. 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 You know, as Mr. Holden liked to say, measure twice, cut once. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> we're going to get those uh, buildings done uh, the correct way. Uh, so our next uh, discussion item is the board self-evaluation. Uh, board policy requires us to self-assess uh, ourselves uh, annually. So in, I think, the end of September, we did an online survey through the Michigan Association of School Boards. Thank you everyone for participating. We are rated ourselves on seven different categories, which are leadership, academic performance and accountability, board responsibilities, board effectiveness, data-driven decision-making, board superintendent relations, and community engagement advocacy. So considering we had um, two new board members, I think, Alan was only at one meeting before he had to take the <laughs> survey, so he gave us a lot of excellence uh, <laughs> just based on that. But no, really, we didn't uh, do badly. Our highest score was on board superintendent relations, and our lowest was on data-driven decision-making. Um, everything, uh, I didn't do an over presentation, but everything was in the um, good and satisfactory overall across all the categories. <coughs> Uh, community engagement was a little, little low on some of the scores, so we're going to be working on that. Um, we had no unsatisfactory ratings on any of our categories, so that was pretty good. Um, two of our lower percentages were, I think, kind of affected a little bit by the don't know answers from some of our uh, board members who have not been around as long as others. So. Overall, I think um, we did a good job, and I think we continue to improve. So, does anyone have any comments about the? I sent all of you this, these graphs. I think about three or four weeks ago. So, did anyone have any comments? Or anyone good? I have a couple comments. Okay. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> Since you guys evaluated yourselves, one of, one of the things in terms of I'm thinking about the, the community feedback or community engagement piece, we, we just, as I just talked about, we will have a lot of opportunity as, as a board and administration to engage the community throughout this process. So I think one of the things in terms of saying, hey, is there, are there things we can do to, to kind of engage the community in different ways? One, I would point to the recent campaign as an opportunity to we have engaged the community. But next would be how can we continue to involve um, not only our parents and students, but other members of our community in terms of um, engaging them and getting feedback in terms of what the how we go about spending these dollars and how we go about improving the district. So I think it, it aligns well. If we say that's an area of focus for us as a board um, or you as a board. That's we have, we have an opportunity to have a natural kind of feeder system for that process. Um, and the second one was the dis data based decision making. And I talked a little bit to uh, to President Heineck about that today. One of the things that, that I think we will see in this 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 evaluation tool is designed for boards across the state. Um, and one of the things that, that Mr. Lodge and I talk a lot about and we came up at a recent thing is we talk a lot about research-based decisions and, and I will tell you what's the types of, of activities that we're um, looking at from a school district, the research isn't there. We are trying to be an innovative, we've kind of branded ourselves and put ourselves to be an innovative school district. So I just want to caution a little bit in terms of we need data, we need to have good facts when we make decisions, but ultimately we're looking to push the envelope and as we do that, looking backwards at you know what research says on some things or what the data says if we look at student achievement inter meaning the student achievement measures that are in place now for us to look at aren't as relevant to where we think we want to go or where the community I think feels uh, comfortable saying we want to go so we just need to balance that to make sure it's kind of the do no harm we don't want our scores to go down but also we don't want to be driven by trying to move um, you know a specific needle in sixth grade science we want to make sure that we're producing lifelong learners and engaging learners and so we just need to kind of walk that line and make sure we always balance our perspectives associated with Yes, we need to look at student achievement data in order to make good decisions, but we can't let that in a micro, in a, in a kind of a vacuum, drive how we want to lead our, our school district. So, those are my two comments. But again, I applaud the board for, for doing the self evaluation, and ultimately also for being I think, pretty, pretty honest in, in terms of how they reflect, how you reflected on your uh, where you're at. Okay. Um, while we're on Michigan Association of School Board topics, there are. Uh, training classes on December 4th and 5th up at the Oakland School District, which is a little northeast of Fall Oaks Mall for reference. 
Uh, I know Trustee Delhay, Superintendent Graydon, and I are taking the superintendent evaluation course, but there is a whole catalog of courses that are open those two days, so feel free to take a look at it, and uh, Mrs. Waltz will register you for anything that you would like to take. So it's a good opportunity since it's kind of close to home. Uh, I'm dropping my wife off at the mall to shop while we're in class. It may be a big mistake, but yeah, it's be a costly, uh, costly day for you. It could be costly. So. Uh, our next discussion item is the board finance committee update. Uh, Trustee Austin. Pretty, pretty much the only thing that hasn't been touched so far is an hour and a half or hour and 45 minutes. It's a long time, but, um, yeah, we, you, we met with Paul. He was there to talk about selling the bonds. And then uh, the RFP for the architect and the construction company, I mean, that is going to be fast. So uh, Scott's got to work it out on there. And then a uh, brief discussion about the facilities committee that's going to create. And there might be a little overlap with the uh, finance committee. And then uh, Janice presented some stuff about the audit mm -hmm. that everybody's already talked about and the uh, electric choice resolution. Did, did you have, uh, was there an update on the budget to date? Are, are we tracking or? Uh, no, there was not. Okay. But we're tracking good. Yeah, yes. it's still really early. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just checking. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, we probably want to work around the RFP window. Yeah, that's our reason. So that'll yeah. kind of be our focus. Consent agenda. Can I have a motion to authorize the following items as part of the consent agenda? A, approval of the special board of education meeting minutes of October 21st, 2015. B, approval of the regular board of education meeting minutes of October 27th, 2015. C, approval of payment of the general fund accounts payable of November 10th, 2015 in the amount of $241,383.22. And D, receive and file the November curriculum and finance reports. Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying yes. 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 Those opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes seven to zero. Uh, items scheduled on the next agenda, it will be a workshop meeting. And we will be discussing the, the strategic framework and with a, with a bent towards the uh, kind of a quick update on the Heritage Launch Program. So we'll learn a little bit more about that program. So we're we'll talking about the framework in terms of some of the, the process we're using for um, reviewing it. Um, so you get a sense of where we're going with that. Some of the potential modifications we're at, going to be asking probably at the end of the year related to the framework and then kind of an update there and then focus on during the launch. We will also have a board resolution related to the sell, sale of bonds. Um, at that time. Trustee Delhay, will you have a uh, policy committee report? Yeah. Well, or do you want the, that one or that one? When is your meeting? Okay. That's right. We study session. Don't pressure me. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's the holidays. No pressure. Four <laughs> cards done here. This is our second <laughs> chance for a member of the public to comment to the board. Would anybody like public comment? None. Our next meeting will be November 24, 2015 at 6.30 p.m. here at Liberty School Media Center. Can I have a motion to adjourn the regular Board of Education meeting of November 10, 2015 at 7.20 p.m.? All those in favor, please signify by saying yes. 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 Those opposed? Hearing none, motion carries 7-0. Thank you all.